Hey, it's me, Jen again, and today we're talking with an ultrasound expert about his experience with thyroid RFA. We'll be joined by Dr. Mark Levine, coming up. Dr. Levine is an ENT physician in West Nyack, New York, and he is part of the largest single specialty medical practice in the United States. But what sets him apart from his colleagues is that he has chosen to offer thyroid RFA as a treatment option for thyroid nodules. We'll be talking more about that, as well as how patients can better understand their thyroid ultrasound results. Let's get to know Dr. Levine. I was reading about you and I saw you are part of an enormous ENT practice. How many physicians are part of that practice? There are about 220 physicians. That is incredible. Out of those 200 physicians you're working with, are any of them offer, planning to offer RFA at some point or do they think you're crazy for taking this on? No, my, my interest has always been thyroid and endocrine surgery. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was a fairly early adapter when private practitioners did their own ultrasound rather than send it to a radiologist. And because I was an early adapter, I was asked to teach it through the American College of Surgeons and the Academy of Otolaryngology. A natural extension of that, now that you can see the thyroid so clearly, is this radio frequency. So I brought ultrasound to our group, but we now probably have 40 or so ENTs with similar interest in endocrine surgery doing their own ultrasound. We have 47 offices, so they would wow. be scattered. But in my office, there are three of us doing ultrasound. Once I give the green light, I think there'll be a lot of interest in radio frequency. We're not traveling to Brazil right now, so it's a little bit on hold. That was truly a, a superb way to learn the technology. Well, that would be a huge addition to the list of name providers to get a lot of your colleagues on board. So I hope that that will happen at some point down the road when things kind of settle out with travel. Settle out with travel and once it becomes accepted as an insurance reimbursable. Yes, I absolutely think that we're getting there. I am the creator and founder of a Facebook group devoted to the non-surgical procedures for thyroid nodules. In that group, we have a list of known providers and we have, I believe, a hundred across the United States. Do you have many doctors in the Facebook group? Uh, our practice spans New York and New Jersey. Uh, we go upstate New York, we go out to the end of Long Island, and we go down pretty much to the end of New Jersey too. Hopefully once we get more people trained, it'll expand your list of providers. Yes, that would be amazing. Yeah, I interviewed someone in New Jersey last week, but he was not an ENT. He was an interventional radiologist. Okay. And then I've interviewed one endocrinologist in New York City. New York is actually one of the states with the most providers, um, oh, interestingly okay. enough. But, you know, it's it's the majority of them are all in New York City and you're the first one that's not in New York City. So it was just interesting to me to learn a little bit more about your um, this interesting practice you're a part of. And so let's talk about your background a little bit. I am very intrigued by your extensive background in ultrasound. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that kind of relays into you adopting the procedure RFA? When I would run ultrasound courses. Uh, I would begin by saying I've always enjoyed swimming. I've always been very comfortable swimming and kept my eyes open and would swim down to the bottom and always thought I had a good view of everything. But when you put a mask on, all of a sudden now you're seeing the coral and you're seeing the colors and you're seeing the pretty fish that you would not see just using your eyesight underwater. And I make that analogy to the use of ultrasound, that for the longest time, I would do biopsies of thyroid nodules or of other neck masses by palpating it, and then using my fingers to guide the needle into the mass that we wanted to sample. But when you do it with ultrasound, 
it's like wearing that uh, mask or goggles. You see everything very distinctly. You can see where the needle's going. You can see the margins of the mass very clearly. And it, it makes you a much better physician. So I became very enthusiastic about that and purchased our first ultrasound machine maybe 15, 16 years ago. And believe that before every surgery, it's very helpful for me to visualize where the thyroid or the parathyroid or the other gland is in the neck that needs to be removed because it, I have a picture in my head this way better than what a CAT scan would give me because I'm holding the transducer and doing the ultrasound myself. So I began teaching it through the College of Surgeons. I became certified as a, a teacher of ultrasound and have uh, participated in many ultrasound courses throughout the United States and a few in Canada. Uh, so I am uh, enthusiastic, and, and I translated that enthusiasm to the doctors in our group. So I've, I've taught the doctors in our group how to do the ultrasound as well. Being able to visualize the, the gland, especially some of these massive goiters that we use with the radio frequency, allows you to do a much more complete destruction uh, through the transducer probes because you can see where the probes are going and obviously there's a danger if the probes go where they shouldn't be going so the ultrasound's essential for that but it, it's just a further expansion of, of what we can do with ultrasound so I'm, I'm quite enthusiastic about it. You know it's amazing to me that only 15 years ago you said this was not a common practice to use ultrasound in, in your practice? That's correct I had been trained in it but there were questions as to reimbursement. There were questions as to whether we were stepping on the radiologist's toes. The application of doing it yourself, of visualizing it yourself, became so important. And of course, the cost of ultrasound machines came down. The idea of spending half a million or even a quarter of a million dollars on a machine with limited reimbursement you know, was always an issue. But once the cost of the machines dropped so significantly, it, it became just another tool that we would have in the office. We were talking about the Facebook group, and I was going to mention about how in, a, in our Facebook group, we've had several patients mention that they've been successful in getting reimbursement or insurance coverage or even Medicare coverage for their RFA procedures. And so I think we're on the right track. I think that we're headed towards the same pattern as what you were talking about with the ultrasounds is that the procedures are going to start being covered more and more frequently and hopefully universally at some point. And this procedure will just become another tool that you physicians can use to help all of us people with nodules. Right. That, and in countries, you know, outside the United States, in South Korea and in Italy, I believe, a few other places, they're actually beginning to treat small cancers as well. And, and that would be a, another exciting development. Absolutely. We actually have a lot of patients asking about that in our group. We have a handful who've been actually treated, some uh, locally and then some who've gone overseas. But it's very exciting to think about patients not having to lose their thyroid or take radioactive iodine for a small thyroid cancer. I hope that we, we get to that point where that's also you know a common occurrence here in the near yeah. future. Again, I was very intrigued by your extensive background and teaching on ultrasound. And one thing that I wanted to ask you, if you could kind of give both myself and the patients watching this video a bit of a primer on ultrasound, because it is a common thing for patients to be very confused about what all the various terms mean, how to interpret their ultrasound results, because it's very scary when you're handed an ultrasound report and you can't understand what it means. When, when I learned ultrasound, maybe 36 years ago, I described it as seeing a snowman in a snowstorm. Everything was just gray and blurry and you saw vague shapes, but nothing exact. And the new machines are so, so much more accurate. Pictures are, are so much more distinct that it is a wonderful 
alternative to CAT scan in that CAT scan involves radiation. It's still a wonderful tool and we use it a lot, but in situations where we don't have to radiate people, the ultrasound has proven to be very, very useful for that. And it's so much easier with the CAT scan and the neck, you almost always have to use a, a dye to better delineate the structures. And that involves starting an intravenous line. Uh, there are some limitations to people with allergies or with kidney insufficiency. And then the ultrasound doesn't use any dye. And that's not an issue. And obviously, it's, it's so much less expensive as well. So it, it doesn't require pre-certification which oftentimes the CAT scan or the MRI does. And it allows the surgeon to be in charge rather than sending someone away and waiting for a report. So all of those features, I find, make it much more user-friendly. Absolutely. I think it's a great thing to be able to look at the images and understand them yourself rather than having to rely on someone else's interpretation. Well, tell us a little bit about what the different common terms that you would use to refer to like the shape of a nodule or the color of a nodule that would be commonly seen on an ultrasound report. The first thing that we use to distinguish the nodule is how it compares to the other thyroid tissue. So thyroid tissue has an appearance and the nodule is either hypoechoic, meaning that it's darker than the thyroid tissue, isoechoic, meaning that it's the same consistency, as, same appearance as the thyroid tissue, or hyperechoic, meaning that it's much brighter. Uh, it can also, be, another term would be anechoic, where it's completely black, and that's consistent with a cyst. But the nodule itself, typically the nodules we're looking at in biopsying and treating are hypoechoic. And then we look at calcification within the nodule. That is a determination, and those calcifications can be either be classified as microcalcifications or macrocalcifications, depending upon their size. We also look at blood flow within the nodule. That's a little bit softer as a sign, but we are concerned about whether there's an increased blood flow to it, uh, which can be a suspicious finding or it can just be associated with a hyperactive nodule as well, but it's important for us to know that. Uh, so those are the, the typical distinctions we make. And then of course, with the ultrasound, we measure the nodule, which is very helpful too, to determine if it's enlarging or if it's stable. And I've seen a couple of times mention of the term taller than wide. Can you yes. explain that? <laughs> well, that is a way to, guide you as to how suspicious you should be about this in terms of whether it may be malignant or not. Wider than tall is, is a worrisome finding, so we might be more apt to do a fine needle aspiration. I don't know exactly how mine would have been classified. It was when it was originally diagnosed in 2014, it was a multi-nodular goiter on my right lobe. And then over time, those nodules all grew together into one giant super nodule. And so by 2019, I had a giant mass that just completely eclipsed the right lobe. My doctor referred to it as an L shape because it was very long, but then at the bottom, it went across and um, extended over this area, you know, where most people have like an indentation where their collarbones meet, I had a big lump. <laughs> I, I never saw any re mention of that on the report about it, taller than wide or wider than tall, or if that would even uh, be something that would be used in that instance. But I just always th thought that was a, a funny sounding term. <laughs> I had a very high powered trial attorney who had large nodules like that. And, and at the time, even though she had had multiple biopsies showing it was benign, the nodules were distinctly visible. What was reported to her when she would be addressing the jury, every time she would swallow, the nodules would move up and down in her neck, mm -hmm. and the 12 jurors' heads would all bob up and down because <laughs> the entire time she was addressing them, they weren't listening to the words she was saying. They were staring at her nodules, 
and moving their heads up and down as the nodules moved. Oh, my goodness. And she became concerned that she was becoming less effective because the nodules so distracted the jury that they weren't actually listening to her pleading. I ended up removing her entire thyroid gland with all the risks that ensue from that because she felt she needed to have that done to allow her to be effective as an attorney representing her clients. Nowadays, we would offer this person, you know, the radiofrequency ablation. She wouldn't have the risks of injury to her recurrent laryngeal nerves, risk of parathyroid issues. She wouldn't have scarring, which, which she felt was preferable. Fortunately, her scar came out, you know, cosmetically very satisfactory. But the radiofrequency would have obviated the need for all of that. There is a great need for this. Absolutely. You know, it's it's great that she was able to successfully have that surgery and, and remedy that problem. In my particular instance, I needed to have surgery because I couldn't breathe or swallow, but I was not a good surgical candidate. I had this nodule, as I said, for several years, diagnosed in 2014. And in 2019, about early May, I had a urinary tract infection and was given a round of Cipro to take. Three days into that, I developed an allergic reaction. I had a huge, massive swelling of my thyroid, and then the back of my neck was covered in this very unpleasant rash. My doctor advised me to stop taking the medication, and we thought within a, you know, a short time that would all reverse course, but it did not. Since having radiofrequency ablation, my doctor said to me, he believes what happened was that when I had that reaction to the medication, my nodule actually may have hemorrhaged into itself, uh, which is what caused it to just so rapidly. Um, yes, it just became um, almost double its original size in the progress of that allergic reaction. It was fine until it wasn't, <laughs> basically, until this happened. I was I was living with it and trying to avoid surgery. I have a poor surgical past, various reactions to antibiotics. I was not going to have surgery unless there was literally no other option. And I was very, very thankful to discover radiofrequency ablation because there was not a lot of information about it out there for the average layperson to uncover. And at that time, there were only two providers in the United States. I was very blessed to to be able to find it and access it. And now that's why I do this. I tell um, patients about it and interview physicians so that they can get to know these physicians, find them, access this procedure, because a lot of them aren't hearing about it from their doctors because their doctors actually don't know about it. That's correct. And the, the saying is, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Exactly. So if you only know how to operate, you don't think out of the box that way. But more and more papers are being written about it. And I think patients will demand that they will push the envelope here and, and people will get on board. The consensus in our group of we have almost 3000 patients now in this Facebook group is that they want to keep their thyroid. They don't want to have to rely on medication. Well, tell me some, just a bit about just you in general and, and, and your practice and anything unique or interesting that you would want patients to know about you. Well, I was shaped by mentors. Uh, I was fortunate in that I had been a lifeguard when I was a teenager. And, and one of the adults I taught to swim was a world famous endocrine surgeon. As I began to focus that I would want to have a practice, I'd want to do medicine and, and likely surgery, he mentored me. Uh, when I was still in college, I participated in research projects through his practice, got to deal with a lot of his thyroid and parathyroid patients. And then as I became in medical school more sophisticated, I would accompany him to the operating room frequently. I had that experience of watching someone who was truly a perfectionist and an artist perform the surgery. I then pursued this through other head and neck surgeons in my residency and elsewhere to learn their style and, and to almost apprentice myself with them so that by the time I completed my residency and went into practice, I, I felt fully comfortable 
performing head and neck surgeries, immediately began this surgery. It became an active part of my practice. From that, the outgrowth of the the ultrasound and, and now the radio frequency to continually to stay on, you know, on top of the game, know all the various modalities so I can offer my patients the full spectrum of, of care. We, we still do surgery, obviously, but we really try to limit our surgeries only to those people who have significant cancers and, and it is the best treatment for them. I think that's a, a wonderful thing. What I have encountered in my personal experience, and maybe maybe the area where you are located is a bit more progressive towards less surgery, but what I have encountered down here in Alabama and in, in the surrounding area is that surgery is just, you know, immediate. It's it's you jump to it. In fact, it, I'll tell you, um, back when I was diagnosed, my ENT walked in the room the very first time I met him. And he said to me, well, you have a lump in your throat. We can cut it out or we can leave it or you can take some meds. Take your pick. A so nonchalant, huh? very nonchalant, very nonchalant. And then in 2019, the ENT that I saw when I had this massive allergic reaction said to me, obviously, he wanted to remove it. And I, I said, well, what are you going to do if I have a post-op infection? And he said, Oh, we'll just let the infectious disease department handle it. And I was just not satisfied with that kind of reactive stance. I think that as you're talking about, you know, being more proactive and trying to figure out the best, you know, possible scenario and only using surgery when it's really warranted is just, it's a refreshing thing. Uh, patients want to hear that. They, they don't want to just feel like, you know, they're up for slicing and dicing, you know, regardless of their backgrounds. No, I, I explained to patients that when I began practicing, someone with a lump had to have it cut out. It was, that was the best practice for that. You didn't want to miss a cancer. You didn't want to jeopardize somebody by being too nonchalant. But we've evolved the statistics now and 90% of thyroid nodules are benign. And we were doing a lot of surgery on people with benign disease. Now, there's some benefit, some glee in knowing that they don't have to worry about it anymore. And, and certainly hearing that your pathology report comes back benign is a very comforting report to get. It's the happiest feeling you can have after surgery. But you then begin to think, well, maybe I didn't really need that operation if it was benign. And how could we have figured out that it was benign before we actually went to the operating room? And that's where the fine needle aspiration cytology has become so useful. And American surgeons were very reticent about employing that. It was developed at the Karolinska in Sweden. And we waited about 25 years for their data to show that it, putting a needle into a nodule and then pulling the needle out did not spread cancer. And when the Swedes finally convinced us that that was the case, then um, obviously American doctors jumped on the bandwagon. But there was a many decades where we didn't offer what was offered around the world for a good reason, not, not because we didn't want to incorporate it, because we were afraid that it would spread cancer. But sometimes good ideas happen and, and people are just hesitant. And then you say, gee, look how how long we kept people from having this technology. It's funny you said that about spreading cancer from biopsies, because that's a common concern with thyroid cancer and RFA, that the RFA will actually spread the cancer to other parts of the thyroid. Well, that's why, as I understand it, in, in Korea, they're only used, doing it on, on smaller cancers. They have a different approach to thyroid biopsies than we do. They will biopsy very, very small nodules, uh, nodules that are in the millimeter size, whereas uh, most American endocrinologists, surgeons, radiologists, uh, the nodule has to have attained a certain size and certain worrisome characteristics before we bother to put the needle in to do a biopsy. South Korean physicians are finding 
positive biopsy results in nodules that are just a few millimeters in size. We have to learn from what they do, but right now our feeling is that those very, very small cancers will never be problematic for the patient. And by biopsying someone and telling them that they have a three millimeter cancer, obviously the patient's going to want something done. And probably radiofrequency is the better way to treat that than with further surgery. We're just not sure in America if they're actually extending someone's lifespan by treating something so small or if they are treating something that may never be a problem. So that, we say, news at 11. Uh, we just don't know yet. Their volume of treatment is so high that there's so much we can learn from what they're doing. Definitely. Yeah, they've been doing RFA in South Korea for close to two decades, right? I, I believe so. There's a lot that they've learned over those uh, two decades that we're just now starting to scratch the surface with. That's correct. When patients want to seek you out for RFA, how, how is the best way for them to find you? The ENT analogy, that's the name of our practice, has a very sophisticated website with, with instructional material on thyroid uh, nodules and cancer. I don't think it's been updated yet to include RFA. That's something I have to, that's my fault. I have to work on that. But uh, if they go through ENT analogy, I am the only Dr. Levine in the group. And uh, as you had said, my office is in West Nyack, New York. Uh, Nyack is a beautiful city on the Hudson River and would be happy to see anyone who's, who's curious. Thank you so much for watching. You can help others tremendously by sharing this content. Never forget to educate yourself and be your own health advocate now. Watch this next video right here.